in elementary schools. She dragged me around with her, and she would do workshops all across the world, trying to teach culture and language and values. And she would write songs um, to help people learn, to engage students, to teach them that they're special, to teach us about our natural environments. And this is one song um, she, she wrote, and I'm gonna sing it. Not nearly as gracious as she would. It's a very simple song, and it's about tree snails in, in Hawaii. And, and the way she told the story was she said, when ungulates were introduced into Hawaii in 1793 by Captain Vancouver, cattle eventually started to spread across our lands. And, um, and we have these little beautiful tree cells, and they, they buzz in the wind. They sing these beautiful songs, but the cattle started to make it impossible for the tree snails to go down into the forest and to collect water. And so she told a story about these birds and, and ferns that created a relationship with the tree snails and would go and fetch water for the tree snails. And they developed this reciprocal relationship in order to survive in the midst of this foreign population that was running amok in the forest. Um, simple so we can sing and, and every time I hear that song I, I, I can see her um, and I miss her deeply um, <clears throat> but the thing is I'm, I'm not going to tell you a story tonight about my grandmother um, I want to tell you a story about a 36 year old <clears throat> a single Hawaiian mother of two young boys The story takes place in 1959, uh, just a few months prior to the vote of statehood. And um, if you know anything about Hawaii at that time, there was a lot of uh, Americanization that was going on. There was a big, large-scale campaign to try to get Hawaii to become the 50th state. Um, and my father was in the second grade, and my uncle was in third. Um, and at this time in my grandmother's life, um, Imagine what it must have been like to be a single woman in 1959 with two young boys. But she found <clears throat> she found a job in Kona, working at a hotel, and she became what was called the social director. Um, one of the few few hotels in Kona is called Kona Inn, and um, it was at this Kona Inn she basically did workshops. She taught Hawaiian culture, and she sang, and she danced. And and uh, mostly to entertain tourists. And in fact, it was, it was at this place that my dad in the second grade and my uncle in the third grade first started to learn to perform with my grandmother and to accompany her as a little two-man two ukulele band and, and playing with her pop and drums. Um, and uh, so my grandmother found a way to do this and then she found a way to convince them to let her live on property. So, dad was really, my dad said it was a great time in their lives because they lived right next to the beach by the hotel and, 
and when my grandmother would perform and have her events, if they weren't having the help, you know, they could go swim in the pool and, and they had a good time. <clears throat> but one particular night, one particular occasion around sunset, um, my dad and my uncle both tell this story. Um, and they noticed that my grandmother's voice, she was doing a chant at the sunset, and it was all the Malihini, um, Pakeha, <laughs> um, happy drinks, and uh, lots of Mai Tais and all these things. And so um, they noticed my grandmother was chanting, and um, no one was paying attention to her. They were ignoring her and carrying on doing their thing. And they, my dad said he, he could always tell when his mom was mad just by the sound of her, the tenor of her voice. So he kind of got spooked and he looked up and somewhere thereafter, both my dad and my uncle recall a giant road wave, wave <coughs> coming in and washing over the deck you know, right by the ocean. And my ties go flying into the pool and the chairs and the tables shift around and tourists are screaming and ah, you know, it's, it's commotion and chaos. Um, <coughs> a few days after um, this happens, um, giant headline appears in the local newspaper. Um, and it says at the top of this local newspaper, the witch of Kona. Um, and they accused my grandmother of you know, reviving these Pele chants and tradition and, and practicing uh, pagan idolism and I ideology. Um, and I want to take a step back and think about that. Well, today, um, again, I don't know what it's like to be in Hawaii in 1959 and see a mother and be called the Witch of Kona, right? And maybe if somebody called you the newspaper now, who the hell reads the newspaper today anyway? <laughs> but back then, it was the primary mode of communication, right? Um, it was the only thing that was there. <clears throat> About a day or two after that, um, my dad never actually told this story to his mother. He only told it to me within the last five years. About a day or two after that, my dad's in his, his school um, in second grade, and a, and a preacher and the teacher um, take him out of his class, and they walk him into Mopai Kawa Church, which is, which is a local sort of Protestant church that's nearby the school, and they force him down on the pews, and they tell him to accept Jesus Christ as, as his savior. Um, and he said they showed him a, a, a book one page was black, it was black felt, and he said that was for sin. And he said there was another page that was red for the blood of Jesus, and there was one that was gold, and if he accepted Christ into his life, he would receive the riches of heaven. Um, my dad was in the second grade. <laughs> and I can't imagine uh, you know, what that experience did to him. But safe to say, um, he was frightened. So I can't help but wonder uh, what kind of fear and intimidation my grandmother must have felt. What were the thoughts and feelings of my father as a young boy who experienced this kind of intimidation and shame of his mother and her beliefs? As a single mother trying to feed her family, might my grandmother have considered playing it safe? Perhaps just stop practicing her culture, maybe water it down a little bit, right? make it more digestible to those in power, who could have blamed her in her situation? Who would my dad have been if she made that decision? Who would I be, for that matter? <clears throat> of course, if you knew my grandmother, you would know that she continued to do what she believed in for another 50 years, um, while keeping her love, her love and refusing to allow hate and intimidation to overcome her fearlessness. By the time I came into the world, I didn't know that lady. My grandmother was just a respected Hawaiian elder who sang songs for kids in schools. I didn't know the 36-year-old single mother who made this decision. Um, but she made a choice to be courageous. Maybe perhaps it wasn't a choice at all. Uh, maybe it just was who she was. But today, I'm an associate professor. I just stand here. It's the most ridiculous thing. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I'm here with you folks. Bill knows. <laughs> um, and in many ways, my job.
job and my career, the check that feeds my children, they're protected from this kind of thing. I have no idea what it could have felt like to be a single mother working for a hotel and living there and being publicly branded as a witch in 1959. Yet even from my place of privilege, I know what it's like to have faced intimidation and attacks against one's character and political beliefs and like her, I try to maintain a law. I think this is the thing. In times of uncertainty, in the moments of fear, when you feel in your gut the shivers of doubt and angst, when you worry about retribution against you and those that you love for doing or supporting what is right, tonight I pray that you will be courageous for yourself, your ancestors, and your grandchildren. Pray that you'll keep your aloha. If your culture or perspective or story is threatening to those around you who are powerful or those who control your paycheck, practice your culture anyway. Offer your perspective anyway and tell them the best story you know how. If people around you are practicing their culture, speaking their mind or articulating a vision and it's upsetting power, please be fearless and support them. People are placing their bodies, careers, and lives on the line for an issue that helps to protect the weak and the defenseless. I pray you will be courageous and support them. I don't know, but perhaps one of the best defenses against tyranny is to support courage and to have fearless along. To hold in high esteem and to be a supporter of those who risk themselves for a higher cause and purpose. Power maintains itself not merely through the might and brute force, but is most effective through coercion, intimidation, and simply turning us against each other. Tonight, I promise to support you when you're courageous, even when it's unpopular to do so. Please look around you and support those who are brave. Each of, in this room, each of us in this room have or will be challenged and pressured to water things down, perhaps turn a blind eye, to keep quiet, to make things more palatable for the powerful. In fact, these may come with entice enticements and potential benefits and individual short-term rewards for the few at the expense of the many. They could come with fancy titles and letters after our names. My grandmother could have gotten some of those titles a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And if she did, I'm certain I would never have had the privilege of telling this story with you tonight. Mm. So here's the thing. Here at Stanford, we've learned amazing skills, gathered leadership insights from the best people around the world. And in my mind, Sorry, there's no darling. doubt to me that each of you, each of us, will lead. And, uh, the truth is that the future of our peoples depends not only on our intelligence, our knowledge base, and collective networks, or our ability to articulate our ideas and the power of our vision also requires our courage. And the trust that we have in those around us to support that courage. I pray when you go home, back to your communities, weeks, months from now, when this whole experience starts to feel less vivid and real, please keep that courage So to close, uh, I, I want to read a poem, and it's called When We Win. <clears throat> when we win, the EV of a million kupuna, te kuwa na kapai. A night <clears throat> filled with teardrops, warmed in the shapes of justice. Sweet smells, because all the kohoi hoi are in bloom. I hear the kani, the sound of the pahu, shark skin drums, and the laughter. I see faces of all kinds, shapes, and colors, and smiles, because the kakios and scars on the legs have become like a kakao, a tattoo, telling a mo'olelo, a story of love over hate, justice delayed but achieved, the crime of the century, a stolen country, occupied, deceived, but truth built liberation on the backs of those who found ways to stand and pull others up. When we win, 
Every time that Uncle took to work on foot of gout, each time Tutu's hands motioned to the heavens with knuckles full of arthritis and smiles towards the Mo'otuna, flows like white, like water, endless, relentless, finding the easiest path, breaking diversions of centuries old until unity with the Kai, with Kanaloa and the sea. When we win, the world looks in awe, an empire exposed from within and without, power succumbs to truth, aloha over greed and ambition, consumption fails when enough is plenty. David looks back at Goliath, fallen, enough said, we're moving on. When we win, no more bombs to trim the aina, no more ohana spread across continents trying to find money for the next reunion. Auntie, come home. We get one place for you. Plenty aina aloha. And Kanaka child, we never touched your homeland. Come and let me show you how to jump cliff, cannonball, jackknife. <laughs> we get plenty for teach. When we win, the eyes of completing Kanaka political strategies set their sights on what we can do together. Pride and ego, fame and shame, step aside for all us guys. It's a kako thing. Time for Makau Kau, the baby party. What you gonna bring?